Um, it is good to be with you. I'm Joel, one of the pastors, and we are stepping in. I referenced it a week ago, a series called One Way. Everybody say One Way. That's important for us to look at, and you're going to discover more of what that really means for you and for your life. Um, last week, we were looking at why is the church, who was the problem? The problem was, why is the church in America seem to be struggling at times? Not all of them, but even this church. I look at what God is doing in this place, and it's remarkable, but I look at the church as a whole. And that's what kind of gets my uh, heart pumping. And I just go, man, because I know the greatness of our God. How great is our God? Um, so we looked at why. What, that was the problem. Why does the church seem to be struggling today? Um, what I want to do uh, in this coming moment is look at why is it that the person of faith seems to be struggling? Anybody ever struggle with their faith? Anybody? You know, even uh, over the last three decades since I've been pastoring churches and, and stepping into ministry, living in this type of world, um, even the questions that people are asking are different. Um, 30 years ago, I would tell you, and, and this is a, somewhat of a summary, but I think there's some obviously accuracy to it. Um, uh, 30 years ago, it would be like, why do bad things happen to good people? Anybody ever wonder why bad things happen to good people? Today, it's like, well, um, why should I believe God exists if bad things happen? You see, you see the difference? Yes? We're going to be a talking group today or a silent group? And there's a lot of people in here. It's like you're all afraid of getting beaten up. So I look at it and go, why is it that we're struggling so much today? And, and we're going to be able to address this very thing because um, it does seem that people are struggling today more and more. They're struggling to have trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and so today is going to be a message that I believe is a foundational message for anybody who says, I am a Christian. It is a foundational message. So you just get, there's going to be seven primary key points I'm going to make from the word of God that you, you should know automatically. In fact, there would be things that I think everybody knew by the time they were 12, 50 years ago. And now we're like, oh, does nobody believe they don't understand this anymore? It's scripture. So that's, we're looking at a foundational message today. If you think that this message is a bit elementary, praise be to God, because it means you know something, right? Um, here's what it's rooted out of is, uh, I say this almost weekly because it's a passage I think you should have memorized, John fourteen six. Jesus said to him, he, he's speaking to Thomas in this point. Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. All right, so um, I want us to read this together. Can we throw that back up? Let's do that. Let's read this together. Ready, set, go. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you trust that? Do you believe that there's only one way to eternal life? Do you trust in God? Do you have faith in who he is? This is important because I think today, these are things that we can rattle off. But I think we have to evaluate, evaluate if we really actually believe them or not. Right? It's the whole mentality. Anybody ever done a trust fall before? You know what I'm talking about? We've used this before. Everybody's done a trust fall, right? It's like if I just grab somebody real quick and I say, could you help me out? I don't care who you are. I'd prefer you to be large in stature, but I don't care who you are. Pretty much anybody, I'll go, because I'm going to trust that you're going to at least, even if you can't hold me, all five foot nine and seven eighths of me, um, if I fall and you can't quite catch me, at least it's not going to be that bad. I'll be okay. And I think that's how we are with God. We're like, okay, yeah, I trust him. Anybody trust God? Raise your hand. Okay, that's good. We're going to see if you really do in a moment. Because I think we have individuals going, yeah, I trust God. There's got to be a God, and, and that, that's cool. And, and yeah, yeah, okay, I get it. Because if there's created, there has to be a creator. And so, yes. But I think we're measured on our trust. Meaning ground level. Like this is basement level stuff. But what if I have one of you come up? And then I go, okay, now will you trust me? Or what if I, what if I do all the way, right? Just kidding. Um, <laughs> that, that scared me. Um, what if I come all the way here? Does this make anybody nervous? That's so good. That's a winning day. My wife lives with this. All right. But what, what if one of you comes up here? I don't care who you are. Some of you are like, seriously, right? Dutch people, average height is 8'2". So like, you're large people, and it's awesome. I love living life with you. 
But at the same time, like, I don't know if I'm going to, I don't know if I'm going to go from here. Okay, let's be straight up. I'm not going to go from here, right? But if, if I'm down here, even on this level, I'll, I'll, I'll go for it. I'm good. I got a hard head. I'll, I'll bounce up, right? But like the, I think we're limiting sometimes our trust and faith in God. Like I think we, if, can we just be honest that we're all in different phases? It's not wrong to be in a different place. Some of you are still exploring, is God real? And some of you are going, man, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, but man, some of the scriptures, I don't know if I really buy into the Bible because there are parts of it that are really hard. That's what we're going to be diving into today, and that's why when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. It means you can't find truth. You can't find life apart from Jesus Christ. And so do you believe that the words in John 14 are actually true? Because they are important because eternity, I'll tell you what's at stake. Eternity is at stake. So why are we struggling so much as individuals? I do believe that Christians today, um, we often claim experiences more than we claim truths. So I, I need to preface all this with something very important. Do our experiences matter? Sure. But we are here to claim truth. That's what matters most. Right? Truth is regardless of experience or emotion. Hear me say this. Truth is regardless of experience or emotion. And as people come up and talk to me sometimes, like, hey, Pastor, I just feel like I'm like, I, what I want to say is stop. Like, does God care about how you feel? He does, but you're supposed to give up all your feelings and your emotions and your thinking to him. So I really don't, but I do, but I don't, but I do, but I don't, right? Because I really, like, my life is dictated by the truth of Jesus Christ, not by how I feel in the moment. But today we're all about emotions and we're all about experiences, but we're here as Christians to proclaim the truth. And that's the same. It doesn't matter your gender, your race, your ethnicity, your culture, your demographic category that you fall within. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're a Christian, you're to stand and live in the truth. And it's not that these things keep, we're going to talk about all these stages. It's not that you get higher and higher. It's It's through faith alone. But the more you understand and trust God, the greater view you can have of him. Right? Anybody want to see God in a greater way? And so we're to live according to the truth of Jesus Christ. So why do we struggle? Reference the book before, it's by David Wells, The Courage to be Protestant. The Courage to be Protestant. It was written about six, seven years ago, um, maybe a little more. Um, And what he talks about in references there is the autonomous self, right? I've spoken of this. The autonomous self. Today, we just, we, we worship self more than anything else. We're more consumed and occupied by, um, like when you wake up, do you go, man, I just want people to know Jesus more. He is my king and my savior. Or do you go, I'm really concerned about how others are going to think about me. Now, we do speak of it because here's the good news is people think about you far less than you know. They don't care because they're so occupied with thinking or preoccupied with thinking about who they are. They don't have time to think about you. Right? Seriously. But we look at it and we go, man, this autonomous self really does play a role. Because today I see us, and this is why the struggle, the believer is struggle, uh, struggling so much, okay? Is because we pride ourselves in our unique characteristics that make us so special, rather than priding ourselves in being saved by an eternal king. Right? We pride ourselves in where we go to school and what kind of job we have and how much money we make. We pride ourselves on our sexual orientation and where we go on vacation and if we have a cottage or the number of kids that we have and all these different things come into play, right? Like I know that like uh, the whole Dutch thing, if you're not Dutch, you ain't, right? You all know that. Listen, when you live in West Michigan, if you haven't had four kids, you ain't nothing. Like, right? Some people pride themselves in that. I'm supposed to have more kids. I'm like, you're not a good parent. You shouldn't have any more kids. (laughs) Like, hey, that's what everybody does, not you. <laughs> I, we live by these ideas and these notions of this is what we should do. And, well, how does everybody think about me? And I just want to be unique and special. Guess what? You're one of billions of people. 
We are servants of the king, not the king. Right? Amen. But that's where we get lost. We trust self more than we trust God. That's why I ask you to really trust God. We're to be servants, not to be served. We're to be ambassadors, right? We're to be citizens of heaven, not of self. The desire to emphasize the characteristics of self is not godly. Woo! And that's why Jesus, man, did you know that Jesus ticked off a lot of people? And it's not because of his posture was wrong. I mean, he was kind and gentle and loving. And he, like, right? It says that's why uh, Paul even says he, he was talking about Jesus. And like, let your gentleness be evident to all. And that was the definition of Jesus Christ. But he upset so many people because guess what Jesus was not? Politically correct. Like today, we just want, how do you say everything in order to make sure that nobody is offended? The truth offends for those who don't live by it. Now, that doesn't mean I wake up and go, I can't wait to go offend people. I really don't. But it does mean that if we are to live by trusting in him and by knowing who he is, having full faith and saying that, yeah, I'm a believer, it means that the way we parent does matter. It means that, guess what else matters? Our, our politics. Did you know we have a, a presidential election right, happening right now? Anybody? I remember growing up, it wasn't a big deal. It was like, yeah, I'm going to vote for this guy. Oh, not me. I'm going to vote this guy. He's got a, that other guy receding hairline, like it, whatever it is. And now it's, it's just pure hatred. And I don't trust any news outlet. Did you know that I believe, and I'm saying I believe, because I think there is truth in this, everybody has their own narrative. And I'm like, I don't trust any of it. And there's so much, like I'll see one ad that says, this guy is going to do this. And then the next ad says, this guy will never do this. I'm like, well, which one is it? Well, that means if you really trust in God, politics matters. Guys, um, let, let me go. I'm going to preach on politics in about a month. I know that you guys are going to be excited to come for that. Um, and I'm going to be really excited to go home afterwards. But <laughs> it's coming. I, it's, give me, I think it's like four weeks from now. Woo! Yeah! Um, hey! Um, but one of the things that you've got to know with it is, guys, we look at Scripture. You're going to learn about the steps that you believe in today. You're going to look at Scripture. This is what matters more than anything else. I don't care if you like a person or if you don't like them or anything else. There are certain biblical principles we cannot walk away from. God loves every single life. Every life matters. It doesn't matter if you've made mistakes in your past. Like, I can go down this road forever. I will go down this road later on. But that you have to look at the word of God. So now it was always like, you can never talk about politics. Guys, our faith impacts our politics. You can't separate them. I can't separate my trust in Jesus from anything I do in life. You're going to hear that over and over today, right? Listen to this. Belief in Jesus must change behavior to be genuine. Belief in Jesus must change behavior to be genuine. So scripture's clear. The word became, fle- John 1, 14. I'm going to talk about this a lot today. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So here's God giving his son, Jesus Christ, to dwell amongst us so that we can have life. Friends, Christianity, oh man, I talk about the autonomous self. Let me tell you, Christianity is not subjective. It's objective. That's the ruffling of feathers that we often have. But this is the way I think. This is the way I feel. Or, man, I know these people are living like this over here, but they're really good people. And so, no, 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 no. Christianity is not subjective. It's objective based and rooted in the word of God. And again, that ruffles the feathers because sometimes we're like, well, this doesn't feel right. Well, it doesn't feel right because we're so selfish and it doesn't feel right because we're so oriented on the individual. And so when God says, no, I want you to be oriented on me, it doesn't It's not natural sometimes. And so we know that really, in many ways, the church has failed in understanding this. But you cannot, another way to say this is you cannot separate faith in Jesus from anything else in life. 
So some of us, and, and, and in, in a healthy way, sometimes I can compartmentalize. Right? And some things I think need to be compartmentalized. I can compartmentalize certain things when it comes to maybe it's buildings that we're doing or purchasing things or looking at budget. And I can compartmentalize that and I can put that to the side. And then I can come over here and deal with some HR stuff with my friend Mike Joslin. Or I can look at some other issues that are happening in terms of discipleship and speak to those individuals with Tyler Parrott and others. And I can compartmentalize. But faith is never meant to be, meant to be compartmentalized. Our faith is a part of everything. And that's a struggle. We want to go play ball and cuss up a storm and do whatever we want to do. I'm tired of every. I think I'm a good driver, but a lot of people wave to me. <laughs> right? You can't compartmentalize some things. And by the way, I recognize some of you. You can't compartmentalize faith in Jesus from anything else in your life. Jesus came to bear witness to the truth. John chapter 18, verse 37. But we also know from Luke chapter 19, verse 10, that he came to seek and to save the lost and that those separated from God by their sin, that's a problem. We know that as well. And yet, here's, can I tell you really cool stuff? Mark 10, 32, that he came as a ransom for many. so that we could die to self and live for Christ. Philippians 121. All of this matters. And so there are certain beliefs. If you trust God, according to where you are, and listen, it's through faith alone. You're going to hear this over and over today. It's through faith alone. I'm not saying that we can keep climbing a tier of righteousness. I'm not saying that. But the more you believe in him, the better picture you can get of God the more you trust in him in every aspect of life. Seven key tenets. And I want to talk about those tenets today so that we can get a better view. Anybody want a better view of God? Right? It's good. So the very first thing you have to understand, number one, you can write one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, however you want to do it. You can get out your phone and write, type in, hit one. And then first one, ready? God. Write down God. Let me tell you about who God is. And I could spend a week on each one of these. Maybe I should be, but just hear me out. Who is God? Is God real? There are certain people, um, and a lot of people, they want to remove the existence of God. Why? Because as soon as you remove God from the equation, guess what? There is no more guilt. There is no more condemnation, and anything goes. You can live completely for self and never be looked at as being wrong. Right? Right? So God, that's the first one. Is God real? Some struggle to believe because they can't see him. Well, I can't see God. I can't believe anything that I can't see. I've heard that a few times in my life. Some people don't believe, as I was referencing before, because something bad has happened. They're like, well, how can bad things happen to good people? Well, first of all, let me tell you the worst thing about that statement is the word of God says no one, no one is good, no, not even one. So you just made an assumption about how awesome you are, which scripture says you're not awesome, but I gave, but God knew that you weren't awesome enough, and so he gave his son. Like, literally, that question contradicts the gospel. Some of you don't believe because you just can't understand. I've heard this a lot in my life, right, especially when I lived at, over near New York, and, um, and I pastored a church there, and I just I can't understand it. And I can't believe in something I don't understand. Which is really interesting because partly what they were saying, I was like, so hang on. You don't want to believe in God because you don't fully understand God. So you want God to be more like you to believe in him rather than you become more like him? You see what I'm put, putting down? I'm like, you know how arrogant that is? You want God to be more like you. I'll believe in God if I can understand him, and that means he needs to be more like me because I can't understand that whole creation thing and everything that he's done. Do you, do you believe that he is the way and the truth in life? Do you believe in God Almighty? That's the first crux of this. It's the reason I, listen, so many of believers today, they don't even share their faith. I, I think it's very simple. The reason people don't really share their faith is because maybe they don't have much of it to share. I mean, not sharing your faith with someone, if you claim to know Jesus Christ and that he is the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except to him, to not share your faith with a friend, regardless of their response, is the most selfish, ridiculous thing you can tell me. 
I know how my friend can have eternal life, but they may not respond well, so I just won't say anything. Help me, help me out. Right? It makes no sense to me. So if you believe in God, that's important. This is the first of seven things that you have to understand. Basic tenets. Are there others? I could give you 15. Yes. But these, I'm just, I boil, boiled it down to these seven. Christians, if you're a Christian and believe in God, that means you're monotheistic, not polytheistic, right? That's belief in one God. But it goes further than that as well. Because there's other religions that are monotheistic. We believe that God's always existed. He's a creator. He's omnip, uh, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. Omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, everywhere. And right away, you're like, oh, I, can't, can't, I can't get this. Like, how can he be all-powerful and yet allow bad things? Just go with me. He's a creator. 1 Timothy 2.5. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. There is how many gods? One, one God, monotheism. That's what that is. He's the sovereign ruler of the universe. God alone deserves our worship. But I told you it's more than just being monotheistic because there's other religions that are monotheistic. It also means believing in the second thing, which is the Trinity. Father, Son, there it is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's a mystery, but the Trinity matters tremendously. Why? Because, as I say it all the time, Jesus has always been, but he came in flesh 2,000 years ago. He said, I'm going to leave with you the Holy Spirit, a gift, the Holy Spirit. That's Pentecost. We referenced it last week. All of a sudden, here comes the Holy Spirit. The New Testament church starts to burst, burst onto the scene and to change the world. God eternally exists as one God and three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All are co-equal and co-eternal co-equal, co-eternal, and exi- they, they exist in relationship with one another. Deuteronomy 6, 4. I'm just going to write off some text. 1 Corinthians 8, 4 through 6. Matthew 3, 16 through 17. I mean, just over and over. So yes, first thing that you have to believe, that first, so you can get higher, not as being greater as a person, but so you can have a greater view of God. That's all I'm saying. But man, you got to understand who God is and know that you believe in God. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in the Trinity? And third, do you believe in Jesus? He says, John 14, 6, I am the what? I am the, and I am the, you should know this is like, let this, this should be memorized by every single person here. And so Jesus is the son of God. He's been in existence since the beginning, both fully God, fully full deity, full humanity. And that's why it says John 1, 14, we can go to it now. And it says, the word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. The word being Christ, made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. The goal of God, um, hear me say this. The goal of God isn't just to make sure you believe in him. And this is where some of us can fall short and not quite get it. The goal of God is more than you believing in God. The goal of God is for you to be in a relationship with him. Right? It'd be like my kids if I just said, man, the goal of my kids is just they, they just know my name. Like, that's a horrible goal. I want to be in an intimate relationship with my kids, for them to come to me and for us to have conversation, no matter what they've done and mistakes they've made, for them to go, man, I know he's going to be disappointed, but I know he's going to help me. He's going to support me. And he's going to pray for me. I, that's the goal, right? Not just for them to know me by, hey, dad. Right? God wants more than just for you to believe that he exists. He wants to be in a relationship with you. And he primarily has entered into a relationship with us through his son, Jesus Christ. He gave us, that's the Jesus piece, the third piece here, to say, oh, we can have this relationship through Jesus who took our sin, paid the price. This is why Jesus is so important. He, John eight twenty nine says that he lived a John eight twenty nine says that he lived a perfect life here on earth. That Matthew twenty six twenty eight that he was willingly crucified on our behalf, which is interesting. I mean, like, so if you're a believer, you want to talk about we need to work at getting rid of self because that's the picture of Jesus. He did a lot of things he didn't want to do. Stop saying God, I don't want to, 
and start saying, God, whatever thy will is. So yeah, you need to know, you got to ask yourself, do you trust, do you believe in God? Do you trust, believe in the Trinity? Do you trust, do you believe in Jesus? Fourth, the Bible. Um, what is the Bible? People are like, what, what is the Bible really, do you think? I, the Bible is the primary way, the primary way that God reveals himself to us. It allows us to see his character and his nature and who he is. Now, some people say, why do you believe in God? I don't say because the Bible says to. Does the Bible say to? Yes. But remember, God doesn't exist because of the Bible. The Bible exists because of God. See what I'm saying? Picking it up? Yep. So there's the difference. The Bible reveals his truth, reveals his character, reveals his purpose, reveals his plan for our life, which is wonderful. And it's the primary way, is, again, to understand God, to understand his character, to how, even to how to live a life that honors him and gives him glory. Belief in the full truth of God's word is crucial. But the Bible instructs us, and it is his perfect word. He used individuals to give us his word, his perfect plan. And as soon as you compromise any of it, none of it really matters. As soon as you compromise any of it, none of it really matters. Because then who are you to tell someone else that they can't take out that part? So we don't add to Scripture, we don't remove from Scripture. So we don't have all these other written rules, over 600 of them that they had, right? The Jewish people and Jesus said, oh, I've come to do things different. So we don't make up all these different rules. We don't add to Scripture, but we don't remove from Scripture either. And that's going to become more and more offensive. The reason I am preaching certain things right now is because I think it very, very quickly, a day is coming where um, the weeds will be pulled. And literally, I mean, so... I'll just, Thursday, I get on a phone call. I had a Zoom call here with some people and their pastors. And they're, I'm not going to say the country right now, but in, in a nation, the guy drove eight hours one way to get me on a Zoom call to ask us to, to come, please lead a pastor's conference for them in that nation. And they've already gotten permission from the people from another nation who actually rule and run that country for us to be able to come in and teach them. As long as we stay in that perimeter, I can go teach them about how to be a better pastor. And I looked at this guy on the screen on Thursday, and I just knew. I didn't know the story yet at that point. I, I'm, I zoomed into a room, and then I'm zooming out and going in and out and all these different places. And I stand, and I go, I literally muted the button. I said, who's that guy? Because you knew there was a presence. And he's been at gunpoint. He's been beaten. He's been put in prison in order to raise up pastors to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want us to be prepared. And so, yeah, we're going to hold on to the Bible, to the word of God at all costs, at all costs, at all costs. I will preach the Bible regardless if there's only three of you sitting in front. Because otherwise, none of it matters. Amen? Like, do you believe that? So do you, do you believe that he is the way and the truth and the life? Do you believe in God? Do you believe in the Trinity? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in the Bible? Do you believe in sin? Fifth thing. Do you believe in sin? That sin is what's broken in our life and in our world. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? But I want to I surround that with 22 and 24 as well. Romans 3, 22 through 24 says, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have what? And fall short of the glory of God. Now, here's what, that's why you can't remove Romans 3, 24. Because if you just said, man, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that's kind of depressing. Anybody else think that's depressing? That's called a bad day. Somebody yesterday, somebody came up to me like, man, I was like, how's your weekend? They're like, man, I had a flat tire yesterday. I'm like, I'll tell you a bad day. <laughs> this is a bad day. But then he says, but all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's like a giddy day. Like, right? I've never used that word like that, but uh, you know what I mean? 
Like, right? It's like, wait, hey, hey, you, you've messed up so bad, you got no hope. But because of what God did through Jesus Christ and the conquering of death through his resurrection, you've got eternal hope. And now it's an anchor for the soul. And now you don't have to live by the emotions of this world up and down and the waves of the sea. But you can be grounded through Jesus Christ. And no matter what happens, you have his love, hope, fulfillment, purpose, peace, and rest. No matter what, you have a king. That's a different type of day. Amen. It's just like, come on. And that's why the next thing you have to believe in is the gospel. It's called the good news. This is six basic tenets of faith, the gospel. It's the good news that, Christ, that, that God in Christ took the initiative to provide the sacrifice needed to pay as an atonement for our sin on the cross. That he was buried for three days, and on the third day, he rose from the dead, proving his identity for the Son of God and securing for all who believe in him eternal life. It's the good news. Like, how much do you... Anybody believe in the gospel? Anybody believe in the gospel? That's good. Okay. Some of you don't. That's okay. I'm, I'm, I'll just call it out. That's all right. But here's this. The more you trust and believe in the gospel and what Jesus Christ has done, the more it changes you. Is it about you earning it? No. But the more you've been impacted by it, the more it changes you. How has the gospel this week changed you? Romans 1, 16 through 18. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Romans 1, 16 through 17. I'll just do that. 16 through 17. We often quote, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for there's the power, right, of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. But verse 17 is also very important, which says, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. And so, it is right, so, and so it is written that the righteous shall live by faith. And you're like, oh, faith. How much faith do we have? How much trust do we have? How far up this do we go? And no, I'm not talking about the different tiers and you can get higher and higher with God and a better. No, I'm just saying I want you to have a better view of God. That's all this is. I just want you to have a better view of God. And the more you trust in him, the more you can rest in him, the more you can find comfort in him, the more you go, man, I believe in his word. And I'm going to jump into that every day and allow that to ground my soul. Right, because you can't trust in your own heart. The word of God is very clear that you can't trust in your own because the, the heart of man is, de, is deceitful above all things. That's what scripture says. Right, the reason we struggle sometimes in our trust and our, and our understanding of faith in Jesus Christ and in who God is is because we have become so self-centric. I want to come back to that again. Because we're emotional and we just want everything we can to like, but this is what feels good. But our emotions should be determined by our faith, not the other way around. Because we know that the man, uh, the heart of man is deceitful. Seven, salvation through faith alone. So I know you're going like, oh, is he expecting us to get higher? No, no, no. It's, it's through faith alone. We only have salvation through our faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. As soon as your heart professes faith in Jesus Christ, you know what it is to be, have eternity with him. Hear me say that. God desires for all people to know him. God sent Jesus to sacrifice himself to take the punishment that we deserve. His resurrection shows that he defeated eternal death on our behalf. That's um, Mark 16, verse 6. And then in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. This is not from yourselves, but it is a gift from God. It's not from your works so that no one can boast. Right, that's, that's why I'm like, wait, hang on. Everything that you have that really lead, that matters, that leads to eternal life, you can't boast about it because it wasn't, you didn't do it. He did it for you. And those are the basic tenets that we have to understand. And I know that there are other things. Some, like, just, I get it. I, 
I, again, I could preach 15 different things. I could preach on the return of Christ, that his kingdom is going to be set up for a thousand years, yes. And that not only that, that afterwards he's going to restore all things into a new heaven. And we can talk about that. But those seven, these are the things that you've got to get. If we can get this, we've got a foundation to really build off of. We've got a foundation that we can really thrive in. Because some of you, because you're not, you're like, ah, I'll, I get it. Like the pastor, I know what he says, but I'm still going to live what I want. And then I'll see what this says at some point. Well, that's 1 Corinthians 9, 26, when Paul says, this is 1 Corinthians 9, 26, and he says, um, and so now I do not run aimlessly. Now, there's so many believers who are running aimlessly because you're still chasing self rather than trusting in God and all of these key tenets. Now, yeah, but this is what I want to do, and we can justify. Some of, some of us, man, I, you want me on a debate team on either direction. That's the problem. But I can't trust my own heart. I trust in the word of God. Because I know that the heart of man is deceitful above all things. And so we start to turn things and to twist things. And I get, like, that's, that's that emotional thing. We just keep making decisions that are emotional. Uh, this is what I want to do. This is what I think we should do. This is, and, like, and so now all of a sudden you feel slighted by someone. Well, let me tell you right now, you all slighted the son of God. Right? As soon as you get on to somebody else about what they did wrong, when you remind yourself of what you've done wrong that you've been saved from, automatically it tempers the situation. And I get what it is to allow my, my emotions to start making decisions. Right? I, I was telling the earlier service and I was looking at them. I was like, guys, literally it was a year ago. I was, I was, an, I was out. I was done. I got some friends who always say, when you leave, give me a call. I started calling my friends. I said, I'm out, I'm done. I'm done with this. I'm done with telling people the power of the truth of the gospel and they do nothing with it. And they're flipping and they're up and down. I'm like, man, just forget this, I'm out. And I started having issues with the elders. Wasn't their problem, but I had issues with them. For the first time, I was like, man, there's a wedge between me and the elders. Now this has been a while, so hear me say. So I'm telling it now, not back then. And so I remember the conversation just under a year ago, I met with someone named my wife. And I was like, honey, I need to talk to you. We're, I can tell you where we were. We're driving in the car. I can tell you exactly where we were. Oh my goodness. And I said, hey, honey, this is the reality. Is I, I mean, I've got a problem with the elders. I think I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna step away. I'm gonna be done with church and not with church itself, but like serving here and just, I'm done. And she's like, it sounds like you have a problem. I said, what problem? She's like, you. And my first response was, I wanted to let her know how wrong she was. Right? Anybody even like that? How did I, that? What was in me was how dare you. But what I found myself, I'm a dad driving a car. And all dads, when they drive a car full of kids, want to do their best to still try to look semi-cool. Amen? And how cool is this? I'm like crying. And I'm not looking at my wife because I'm like, because I knew she was right. Because I was allowing emotions and feelings to dictate what I thought was truth rather than allowing truth to dictate my emotions and the decisions that I would make. You hear me? You ever done that before? In that moment, everything changed. I came back, met with the elders. I said, I repent. I'm sorry. I'm in the way. Won't happen again. Which we all know it will, but I'll get better. Because <laughs> we're sinners. We're broken in need of a savior. And that's why I hold so desperately onto who Jesus is and the Bible and the Trinity and God himself. And that I know that it's through salvation, through faith alone. I hold onto these principles. How are you being changed by trusting in that God? How are you being changed by saying he is the way, he is the, and he is the, do you believe it? Is it changing you? Or do you wake up so occupied and consumed by, well, I don't know what other people are going to think about me today. It doesn't matter. What matters is what they think about my God.
Everybody lift a hand. And so God, I come before you. I thank you for these brothers and sisters. And I ask that you would allow them to step more fully in to embracing your truth, the core tenets of what it is to be a believer and to know it's through salvation and faith alone, to know and to believe in the power of God Almighty, to believe in the Trinity, the mystery, and to recognize that we can't fully understand it, but we're in. God, may they know what it is to, to, to understand that they're a sinner, that they're broken, that they live in a fallen world, but we have been redeemed in love and in grace and in purpose and in hope and in just kindness and forgiveness and we are so overwhelmed. Let us be overwhelmed in gratitude for who we declare you to be. In Christ's name, amen.